Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Welcome back to the Mosin Museum on a quite a fine spring day. As you can see, the hummingbirds are back. And with that, we of course have to celebrate by doing a video, but not just any video. Today, we're really gonna be breaking ground in the Mosin collecting community because we're gonna be talking about a subject that I can't find documented anywhere in any book. And so I've kind of sort of spent the last couple of years doing a whole lot of research on the topic of Austro-Hungarian Mosins, and specifically what we're going to be talking about today is how on earth did they get to America? Now, there's probably going to be one or two of you screaming into your uh, phones or mobile devices right now saying, Big Sam, Finland! They came from Finland! Well, that's good that's pretty observant however that doesn't actually quite qualify for what we're talking about today you see we're really talking about a specific type of austro-hungarian mosin we're talking about caliber conversions now when we talk about austro-hungarian mosins that came to america via finland we're, we're automatically sort of disregarding caliber conversions because finland didn't preserve the original caliber conversions um of course, when I speak of caliber conversions, I'm referring to the Austro-Hungarian conversion from 762 by 54 rim to the Austro-Hungarian 8 by 50 rimmed cartridge. Now, that can mean a couple of different things, which we probably won't get into the nitty gritty of in today's video. But what we're talking about specifically is all of the guns that fit into that broad range of caliber conversions. How on earth did these rifles get to America? Like this particular guy, which we haven't actually done any filming yet. This guy is, as you can see, he's an M91 rifle from World War I. And he was produced by the Chatelreau factory in 1894. Um, but what makes this one interesting is he's got this little mark on the barrel here from Johann Springer's Urban. Um, and this guy was actually uh, rebarreled and re uh, rechambered to 8x50 rimmed. Now, this didn't come to America by way of Finland. This is what we would consider to be a, a bring back rifle. But this is where things really just drop off into the abyss when it comes to information. Because as far as I as far as I'm concerned, based off of like what I learned in public school, well, I didn't go to public school, thankfully, but if you went to public school, you would probably have learned that um, this rifle shouldn't have gotten here because in order for this rifle to have gotten to America, a U.S. soldier would have had to bring it back. And this is where things get interesting. Uh, in what theater was America fighting the Austro-Hungarian Empire in World War I? They don't teach this in public school. And I haven't found really good, uh, really good information in any kind of Mosin or military firearm collecting book about this topic. And so uh, I was stumped on this for quite a while, but I knew there had to have been a way for this rifle to have gotten here. Um, you don't really see rifles like this, but just, you know, the fact that this one is here, even if, you know, it's a total anomaly, well, it didn't get here on its own. And so there had to have been a good reason why this rifle got here. Um, did this rifle come from the Western Front? No. Um, now, there were actually a few Austro-Hungarian uh, units on the Western Front, but we're not really going to get into that today. It, it's exceedingly and abundantly unlikely that this rifle would have been used by the Austro-Hungarian units that were sent to aid the Western Front uh, around 1918. That is just not reasonable to think about. So let's try to find a scenario that is reasonable. Uh, and again, this is we're going to be talking about something today that they just don't teach in public school. Um, we're going to be talking about an American infantry regiment that actually fought against the Austro-Hungarian Empire today. And that is the 332nd Infantry Regiment. Now... How, how did they do this? Where did they fight them? These are all great questions. Uh, succinctly put, if we go back to the year 1918, um, in the aftermath at the Battle of Caporetto, the Italians uh, were really 
uh, reeling in a lot of ways, uh, not just, um, you know, physically, not just from a logistical perspective, but also uh, mentally. It, it had been a very long war, and they had a lot of losses, and it just didn't really look good for them. They didn't really know how they were going to continue to press on. Um, it was a pretty humiliating uh, defeat that they suffered there at the 12th Battle of the Isonzo, a.k.a. the Battle of Caporetto. So, um, one of the things they did was they reached out to General Blackjack Pershing and said, can you please provide, just, just send an American battalion over here. Um, just having some Americans over here, because uh, they were already in France by 1918, just send a battalion over here and the morale of the entire country is going to skyrocket. Uh, and it wouldn't have taken very much for it to skyrocket because that's how low it was. Um, so Blackjack Pershing was uh, kind of famous for not wanting to spread out Americans into all the different theaters. He really wanted to focus on the Western Front. But he did send in three uh, notable expeditions Americans to help on other fronts. We had the uh, Northern uh, Russian Expedition. We had the Siberian Expedition to Vladivostok. Um, and those are the two that really people only ever talk about but there was a third one that we never talk about and this was the 332nd infantry regiment's expedition to italy this is where things start to get really weird yes so he actually not only sent a, a battalion one battalion he sent a whole regiment which i believe was three battalions if you want to know more about this you need to get this book american lions the 332nd infantry regiment in Italy in World War I. This is a real thing, folks. I'm not making this up. By uh, Robert J. D'Alessandro. Um, it's actually quite a thick book. A lot of fantastic, detailed eyewitness accounts. Um, fantastic pictures. And what's really interesting about this is not only did the Americans go to Italy just to be there to provide morale, they actually ended up fighting the Austro-Hungarians uh, on the basically on the northeastern side of what we would consider modern-day Italy. Uh, in fact, this is where things get interesting. Reading this book, it seems that the Americans uh, captured a town, uh, an Italian town by the name of Cadroipo, and there it is documented that they captured um, millions of dollars in. Austro-Hungarian equipment, including rifles. And not only that, in this book, it talks about how the Italians were so elated, they let the American soldiers go in and take souvenirs. Yes, you can probably see where this is going. Now, there's only one problem at this point, linking this story with this gun. How did this gun get to Italy? Um, well funny you should ask now i've also spent many many hours trying to figure out did mosin nagants actually ever make it to italy and the short answer is absolutely they did um we can figure this out by a couple of ways number one are there any mosins in museums in northern northeastern modern day italy uh the answer is yes i found at least two and these are world war one mosins mind you so just right off the bat, there are Mosins in Italy that ha or there are museums in Italy that have Mosins. That's and World War I Mosins. That's really interesting. I wonder how they could have got there. The other way to do this is by looking at photographs. Yes, so you can look at photographs uh, like this one, which I think I put out a teaser a while back. Again, looking at these photographs and wasting hours of my life. It's sort of like playing a game of Where's Waldo, but instead of Waldo, you're looking for a Mosin. If you look really carefully in this picture, you'll actually see there's an M91 rifle um, that this Austro-Hungarian soldier has on his back, and you can also see his bayonet scabbard if you look hard enough. Um, this is just one example of Mosins used in Italy. Uh, my favorite example is probably this picture, though. This is an Austro-Hungarian stormtrooper at the uh, stormtrooper training grounds in uh, Shabs. And this is right around the area of northern Italy, right around that whole the, kind of the border of Italy and, and Austria. And this guy has a, a dragoon, could be a Cossack. It's probably a dragoon by looking at the handguard. But 
Um, either way, the moral of the story is Mosins absolutely were used in Italy. And now things are starting to make sense. We're starting to develop a plausible scenario by which this gun made it here. Um, it's, it's quite possible, and in my opinion, very likely that this rifle was uh, brought over back to America by a, a service member from the 332nd Infantry Regiment. This is not definitive, but it is the most plausible scenario that I can really find. Or so I thought until I found another scenario. Yes, there's one more scenario that we need to talk about. All right, we need to also talk about this rifle. Now, before we get into it, this is actually not a Austro-Hungarian caliber conversion. However, I wanted to talk about this and it's extremely relevant because this is a bring back. So if it's a bring back not from Finland, I don't really care if it's a caliber conversion or not. If it's an Austro-Hungarian bring back that's not from Finland, it's really relevant to the conversation today. Now, you might notice that this rifle has a duffel cut. If you ever see an M91 with a duffel cut, you should probably look carefully because those don't really exist anywhere. This is the only one I've ever seen. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because, you know, troops weren't really bringing M91 Mosins back from World War I. Except one did, at least this guy did. Now, and, of course, the other one that we just looked at. Now, how he managed to not duffel cut that one, I don't know. Um, that's a whole conversation for another day. That's actually not the original stock on that gun, but it, we're going to have to do a whole other video on that because that gun is just crazy and has an interesting story. This has a much more interesting story, though. And, of course, this one was duffel cut. Why? How? Well, I was kind of perplexed, and unfortunately, we never would have actually known the story behind this particular gun if it wasn't for the fact that the service member that brought this back from the war hadn't stamped his name into the bottom of the stock. Yeah, he actually did that. Now... Um, you know, that can be really hit-miss. If he sta if his name was, like, uh, John Smith or something like that, good luck finding out who that guy actually was, because there's about a bajillion John Smiths uh, that have lived in the past hundred years in America. Uh, happily, it was kind of a more unique name. Um, the chap that brought this one back was named Woodburn. And as you can imagine, Woodburn isn't exactly the most common name in the world. And if any of y'all that are watching right now decide to name your next child Woodburn, uh, you will be given extra kudos from the Mosin Museum in this chap's honor. Um, so this was really cool. Um, I was able to actually find who this man was, and turns out he was a sailor. And he was... In the Navy during World War One, except he technically wasn't in the Navy when he got this. This gets really confusing. I mean, I guess maybe he was. It, you be the judge. So basically what happened here is Woodburn was on a ship called the USS Sherman. And he, this ship helped deliver supplies uh, to France in 1918. Okay. He didn't get this rifle from France, though. And this is a story I had never heard about, which is why I was very happy to find this rifle. Apparently, though, according to the documentation online for the USS Sherman, after that, in 1919, it was actually renamed to the USS Durham. Um, it was painted this really neat dazzle camouflage at some point. I don't know exactly when. Um, but this was to avoid German U-boats. And... This um, USS Durham was actually acquired by an entity called the Naval Overseas Transportation Service. And instead of going to France now, this ship was tasked with a mission to send humanitarian aid, not to France, to the Balkans of all places. This story gets really weird, folks. Now, what was really interesting here was um, I was actually able to contact some of Woodburn's living relatives, and 
Not only did they know of his story, one of his relatives actually had all of Woodburn's uh, diaries from his entire journey to the Balkans and back. So we have a pretty good sense of how Woodburn got this rifle. Now, he doesn't specifically mention this rifle in his diaries. However, it's very safe to assume that he got this um, at the port city of Zelenica, Montenegro. How did this rifle get to Montenegro? Well, it's anybody's guess, but one of the really other interesting things that I want to mention is, this is really cool because it ties into what we were just talking about. If you read to the end of this book, it mentions that a small subset of the 332nd Infantry Regiment was actually sent from Italy all the way down to the Balkans, uh, even around the area of Zelenica. What's really cool is that Woodburn's diaries actually corroborate this because I found an entry where one day he mentions the, the 332nd came aboard his ship and it sounds like they brought a lot of souvenirs with them. So this rifle could have come from the bulk, well this rifle of course did, but it could have come straight from the Balkans. It's even possible that this rifle also came from uh, that uh, one of the armories they captured in Italy and then was taken all the way down to the Balkans, although that doesn't seem necessarily as likely. One thing I can tell you is that Woodburn did duffel cut this himself because he kind of alludes to it in his own diary, which I thought was kind of cool. So if you ever wonder how U.S. service members brought back Austro-Hungarian Mosins during World War I, you need to remember the two most likely scenarios. One is it was a service member from the 332nd Infantry Regiment on the Italian Expeditionary Force that found one of these while they were there, or it was from a sailor who was part of the Naval Overseas Transportation Service that had sent humanitarian aid to the Balkans and brought it back on his ship because one of the things Woodburn talks about is these port cities were just filled to the brim with souvenirs. Uh, he also picked up a small Austri uh, Austrian rifle, probably a Steyr M90 or an M95, as well as a Montenegrin gasser um, for like two dollars or something. I, yeah, I would have I would have loved to be there. Um, what's also cool is this helps us understand how some other Austro-Hungarian weapons got to America, specifically um, Schwarzlose heavy machine guns that are actually functioning. We're not talking about, you know, deactivation or deactivated guns or guns that, came, you know, were built from parts because we're talking about original functioning uh, class three registered Schwarzlose machine guns. Uh, Grandpa, Grandpa Woody, as we call him now, actually mentioned in his diary that one of the boys on the USS Durham, brought aboard a heavy machine gun and they did a raffle. Grandpa Woody was pretty sad because he didn't win it. I would have been pretty sad as well. But if you're wondering, that's probably how those rascals got here. Because they sure, most likely, they didn't come from the Western Front. So a really, really interesting tidbit of history. And I wish there was some type of documentation on this in, in literature for Mosins, but there's just none. So that's why we're bringing this to you today. Hopefully you guys got a kick out of this and found this video interesting. We're going to be doing uh, doing more in-depth videos on these rifles that we've taken a look at here, but I just wanted to give uh, a really cool overview on this, especially because we haven't done a video in a while, so hopefully you guys found it useful. Let me know if you guys got any prayer requests, and we'll see you next time.